They had been told that they would soon be taken to paradise. Chosen by the great masters of the universe, these disciples were ready to fly off to a distant planet. What their leaders had forgotten to tell them was that this cosmic trip was going to cost them their lives. These unfortunate gullible souls were unable to tell the difference between cosmic visionaries and imposters. In October 1994, the horrific incidents involving the Order of the Solar Temple, which took place in both Switzerland and Quebec, put the spotlight on the hidden world of cults, which were created during what is now referred to as the Contactee Movement. In 1952, an American immigrant of Polish descent gave a whole new meaning to UFO sightings. Before a room full of press agents eager for a sensational story, George Adamski said that he had telepathically received a message telling him to go to the Mojave Desert, where he saw a spaceship. Adamski claimed that he was in contact with the pilot of the craft, who said he came from Venus and was here to warn humans of the dangers of nuclear weapons. Adamski's story was hailed by UFO groups as proof that UFOs were of extraterrestrial origin. The following year, Adamski co-authored Flying Saucers Have Landed, which became a huge success and marked the beginning of the contactee movement. In the months following the publication of this book, several individuals claimed that they had also been contacted by extraterrestrials from Venus or Mars. Well before that, at the turn of the century, researchers at the Lowell Observatory had noted features on Mars that seemed to indicate the possibility of seasonal patterns. And according to Schiaparelli and Percival Lowell, these features might be channels made by intelligent beings. In the 1950s, astronomers were already aware of the properties of the planets in our solar system, like Mars and Venus. It was known that Mars had a very thin atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere was very thick and hot. Still, researchers had a fairly good idea of the patterns on those planets. If we look back, there was that famous radio program by Orson Welles that shocked the world in the 1930s, just when World War II was starting. Radio listeners thought that Earth was being invaded by Martians. I think that society's fascination with the possibility of alien visits was stoked by events such as that. Astrophysicists and photography experts proved scientifically that Adamski's claims had to be false. From then on, UFO groups distanced themselves from the contactee movement. Ignored by the UFO community and often ridiculed by the media, the contactee movement developed on the fringes. Nowadays, there are hundreds of these semi-religious groups who believe that we are in contact with extraterrestrials. Head of religious studies at Laval University in Quebec City, Alain Bouchard takes a keen interest in these new religious beliefs. If we look at the number of groups generated by the contactee movement, we're talking about several hundred. But they're mostly small groups with just a few members each. We would need field researchers to find them all. In most cases, the group only lasts as long as its founder is alive, or until the novelty of a revelation dies down. One of the first mysticism-based UFO groups to crop up in the United States was the Unarius Academy of Science. Unarius stands for Universal Articulate Interdimensional Understanding of Sight. My name is Dr. Charles Spiegel. I'm the present director of the Unarius Academy of Science. Unarius is a nonprofit, tax exempt, educational, and scientific foundation. 
33 spaceships that will land, will land right here on this land. In fact, I can point right up here where this sign is, it says, Welcome Space Brothers. Despite the fact that its two founders had left their mortal remains on Earth and extraterrestrials had failed to show up at the appointed contact times, Unarius continues to flourish with more than 6,000 members. Ruth and Ernest Norman founded Unarius in 1954, claiming that aliens had asked them to free humanity of its karma. Since, according to Unarius philosophy, Current humanity is nothing more than the product of a series of reincarnations. Ruth Norman claimed that she was the reincarnation of Socrates, Mary Magdalene, and Mona Lisa. The future of the Earth world is positive, progressive, we promise you. While it's true that most groups created by the contactee movement were trendy and harmless, the horrors of the Solar Temple led to increased vigilance by state and civil authorities. Mathieu Cossu maintains a French internet site designed to protect people from the dangers of cults. People like to talk about UFOs and extraterrestrials. There's a certain mystery to them. In the US, a lot of subjects were raised by contactee groups. For example, a while back, there was a guru who used to talk about universal energy. A master Dang, that was his name. He supposedly received instructions from higher beings who came to see him while he was traveling on an airplane. There was also Izozen, a sect whose guru received messages. To attract new members into their flocks, they needed a gimmick, one that would seduce people in different ways. For instance, a sect might attract new members by claiming to have the answers to questions that we all wonder about. Who are we? Where are we headed? What will become of us? Claiming that extraterrestrials are coming makes the group more mysterious and attracts people to that group. The more mysterious the discussions, the better. And when discussions focus on extraterrestrials, the members of the group feel privileged. I'm part of something special, and extraterrestrials are communicating with me. Extraterrestrials appear to have the same qualities as God. They know everything and can do almost anything. Technologically speaking, they're 25,000 years ahead of us, according to the Raelians. So an extraterrestrial is like a god. From one group to the next, these New Age religions seem to have the same basic format. If they are not expressly alien in origin, then the founders are prophets chosen to pass on a message from a cosmic visionary. You've always dreamed of studying under Jesus, Buddha, or Muhammad? Well, it's too late for them, but it's not too late to study with me. In general, the message always goes along the same line. There are both good and bad extraterrestrials. The evil ones want to destroy humanity, while the good ones want to save it. The disciples in the cult are the elected ones, who are under the protection of the good extraterrestrials. There is no typical profile, but we've noticed that each group has a family atmosphere, if you will. How can we typify people who join these cults? Choosing a religious minority sets them apart from the rest of society. They generally have a lot of drive, so it's odd that they're usually portrayed as sheep. Research has shown that these people want to distinguish themselves from others. Joining a cult is an act of defiance, since the person will be noticed and perhaps ridiculed. So one of the main characteristics of these people is that they wish to stand out in a religious sense. There are also people who question life. I would say that best describes the people who join these groups. They identify themselves with their group. Probably the main thing that they have in common is a desire to distinguish themselves from others.
I don't think that anyone here on Earth is 100% safe from the powerful influence of a sect. The 1970s and the New Age movement breathed new life into these UFO-based cults. Several leaders stole ideas from Eric von Daniken and Robert Charoux, who had come up with the theory of ancient astronauts. Contactee's visions changed with the times. Pilot uniforms were replaced by long white robes, and extraterrestrials, who had previously appeared in the flesh, now appeared as ethereal beings living on higher spiritual planes. Cosmic messengers no longer needed their spaceships. They could now communicate with humans telepathically. In the midst of this shift in perception, a young man from France, Claude Varillon, publicly announced that he had been contacted by extraterrestrials on December 13, 1973. It seems that Claude Varillon, who had previously gone by the name of Claude Seller when he was a pop singer, was now being encouraged by his cosmic visionaries to change his name to Rael, signifying light bearer. First, he tried his hand at a singing career, imitating Jacques Brel. Raelians sing of honey and cinnamon, but that song was originally called Sacré Sale Gueule, and when he sang it, he looked like Brel's clone. After that, he tried his luck as a sports reporter, since he loved automobile racing. He started a small magazine called Autopop. But when the energy crisis hit in the 1970s, his magazine went down, since auto racing had stopped due to energy restrictions. Then he appeared on a French television program called Le Grand Échiquier. He explained that one day, while walking in the Auvergne Volcano Park, he met up with some beings who said that they were Alhams. They're about four feet tall and had contacted him to pass on a message. In 1973, I was a reporter for an auto racing magazine in France. As I was walking through the Auvergne Volcano Park, I saw a bright spaceship land near me. A small being came out of the craft and gave me a message, which you can read in this book, True Face of God. It's available in all bookstores in Quebec. This message explains that in the beginning, when there was no life on Earth, these extraterrestrials came and created life on Earth. Okay. From then on, people began to contact him after they saw him on television. That's when the movement started. As far as we know, in the beginning, Claude Vaurillon was not an authority figure, someone who takes himself too seriously. He was just a guy with a message to deliver, right? Then gradually, as I see it, he began to get off track. The attention went to his head. The approach changed from a laid-back atmosphere where no one was really in charge, there was no authority figure. This was back in the 1970s, when there was a sexual liberation movement happening and everyone was talking peace and love, to an approach that's entirely different today. If you compare the Claude Vaurillon that people knew back in the 1970s, with the beloved prophet, as he is known today, dressed in his cosmonaut outfit that smells like mothballs, it's amazing to see how he has changed. I think that as he went along, Claude Vaurillon became a typical example of someone who was guru-fied. He became richer and richer. How much do we know about the truth of his original story? We do know that it contains a lot of contradictions. For example, we checked the weather conditions on the day that he supposedly met these beings, and it doesn't match what he said. There was a program on the M6 network in which a childhood friend of Claude Vaurillon's was interviewed. And this friend said that during the course of a meal together, Vaurillon had told him something like, in any event, I made up the whole thing. You already knew that, it's not news to you. According to Roland Chevalier, Vaurillon came up with this tale, people believed him, and he was suddenly in the limelight with more social status than ever before. If you look at the description of Claude Vaurillon given by Jacques Chancel, he was an ordinary middle-class guy who wore glasses. Then if you look at Claude Vaurillon in the 1970s, he appears more lively and liberated. Tout 
Everything Claude Vorion says, his main theme is based on the theory of ancient astronauts. If you look at the cover of the first books published by Rael, you can't help but notice how they resemble books published by Robert Laffont, with a black background and yellow print. Fond noir, lettre jaune, or et compagnie. If you read Claude Vorion's books, you soon realize that they're full of plagiarisms. And his story about the Elohims? That's a plural Hebrew word, which for some people means extraterrestrials. That explanation comes from an author named Jean Sandy, who wrote a book called The Moon Outpost of the Gods. What's interesting is that if you bring up these facts to the Raelians, they will simply tell you that other people had insights before he did, and that doesn't make him any less important. But as you dig deeper, you find plagiarism upon plagiarism. The shape of the flying saucer, for instance, obviously came directly from Adamski. The only difference was that Adamski described it and Claude Vaillant drew it. The similarities go on and on. He even used the symbol of the Star of David with a swastika in the center, which he stole from Adamski as well. It was mentioned in Adamski's book, Inside Spaceships. Everything that Claude Vaillant says has already been said by someone else before him. He simply puts a different spin on it and simplifies it. When you are familiar with other authors, it's more like bad science fiction than anything else. It's plagiarism pure and simple. And when I say he copied other people, I mean dates too. Not only did he steal the image of the flying saucer from Adamski, he also stole the date that the incident happened, December 13th. Unlike France, where a climate of intolerance close to that of a witch hunt has been felt since the Solar Temple tragedy. We must resist the temptation to compare all cults or religious minority groups to extremists like the Solar Temple or Heaven's Gate. In actuality, very few of these groups are a real danger to their followers. The Raelian movement founded by Claude Vaurillon may seem troubling since it is on the fringes of society, but it is still nothing more than a cult. People seem to have started thinking that the Raelian movement is another religion, a sect that believes in God. No. I recall that my original messages were misconstrued by the tabloids. We're anything but a sect. We don't believe in God. We believe in extraterrestrials who are beings like you and I, but much more technologically advanced than we are, creating a sort of cultural shock at the technological level. It's a bit like the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy, where an empty Coke bottle lands on the ground and the Bushman thinks to himself, the gods must have sent this. There are no gods, and there's no such thing as a soul. That being said, how can we possibly be qualified as a sect? I don't understand. I wish to repeat that our religion, as you call it, is not religion at all. It's science. The secularization of religion has led to a drop in spirituality within society. It's as if science was taking the place of religion. Religion is becoming more secularized, while science is becoming more spiritual. Science leads to technological advances. That was one of the traits of the 1950s, a movement towards idealizing technology. Even today, we're fixated with technology. Just look at computers. If I want to be socially accepted, I need a laptop computer and a cell phone. It's almost as if we identify ourselves with our technology. We live in a society where technology is all around us. The same thing happened to religion as well. What we need to understand is that thanks to technology and science, the world we live in in 20 years from now won't look anything like it does now. I'm telling you, it'll be totally different. People think that evolution is progressing at a constant rate, and it will take us centuries to advance. That's just not true. Why? Because of computers. That's what I explain in this book. Computers become almost twice as powerful each year. To sum it up, we've discovered more things in the past 20 years than we have in the entire history of the human race. In the next 10 years, we'll do the same thing. Then in five years, then in two years, then in less than a year, then in six months, then in three months, if we add up all those time frames, we arrive at 2020, 2025. By the time we get to that period, we'll be discovering more within one week than we did in the history of the human race. Then, in a day. Eventually, we will get to the point where transhumans, as I like to call them, will be able to discover major principles within the space of a minute. By 2020, 2025, we'll know everything. <laughs>